Okay, I think we might get started. Okay, have your attention, please. And for the speakers, we don't have microphones, so just talk nice and loud. Okay, well, uh, sorry, my name, I'm Professor Barry Cooper. I'm the Associate Dean of Engagement in the um, uh, Deacon Business School. I'm currently also the Acting Head of the Department of Management in the Deacon Business School. That's the current head of the Southern Maternity League. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you all here to this uh, Deakin University Community Bank uh, seminar in partnership with Bendigo Bank on uh, tax and wealth tips for property and shares. I was to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered here today, and their elders past, uh, present and present. I'd also like to introduce Ashley Wiley, YG, sorry, where's Ashley? And his team, you got your team here with you? Yep. Uh, team stand up. <laughs> Who are based here on the, on the Burma campus. Uh, still in the same spot still over the there. Spot. Haven't moved here to months. more salubrious headquarters yet? No, right? Sorry. So, no, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ashley. Very friendly people. Even when you take money out, as I found out, they're just <laughs> nice tears when you put money in. So, uh, they're good people to deal with. And the Deakin Uni uh, Community Bank, partnering with Bendigo Bank, is the first of its type in Australia uh, at a university. And it's going from strength to strength with, I believe, over 75 million in uh, business generated since the bank opened here in September 2016. And what's important is the bank returns money back to the Deakin community. And I believe that in the coming financial year it could well be a six-figure amount, which is not bad when you consider the very short period of time that the bank has been operating here, which shows a high level of acceptance by both the staff and the students. But it's not just the money going back into our Deakin community in the form of scholarships and so on, which is important, but it's also the fact that staff, uh, alumni, family and friends can also participate in our bank. In short, it's the partnership that is indeed a true collaboration between two organisations that share very similar values. In fact, I was on the initial organising committee uh, when this first working with um, uh, Ron Tudor and a few other, a few of the other people, David, sorry, David Tudor and a few of the other people from Bendigo Bank. And I have to admit, I was pretty impressed. And I have a long history going back in time, uh, even credit unions, and I sort of see a lot of similar values uh, in terms of the community values of the D, of the um, Bendigo Bank. In fact, just reminded me, because at the moment, of course, we all know that even if you watch the Royal Commission, the bank's a bit on the nose, okay? <laughs> it's not a good time to be a banker. However, if you're from Bendigo Bank, that's different. And it reminds me about 10 years ago when banks were a bit on the nose for different reasons. And there were a couple of small banks. One was called St. George, and the other one was called the Bank of Melbourne, which sort of was, sort of had, was perceived to have the same sort of community values that Bendigo Bank, I believe, currently has. I clearly remember an ad on TV, and there's this guy at a barbecue, and he looked a bit like the current CEO who was about to leave the Commonwealth Bank, actually. It's a shade here, and they look like a real banker. Nothing. <laughs> 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 got plenty of hair on your head, I can see it. Uh, you know, they're a typical Australian barbecue, they're all drinking beer and all the rest of it, and talking to one another, and uh, see the barbecue, there's a dog down there wagging his tail, waiting for the odd chop or sausage to drop down. Then, uh, all of a sudden, someone said to this guy, uh, you know, a little chat, what do you do? He says, oh, I'm a banker. <laughs> Everyone stops. <laughs> Dead. No one said a word. Even the dog got a bit depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your legs and started to wander off. Then he said, but I'm from St. George. Oh, you're from St. George. Oh, you're one of the good bankers. You're drinking again. The dog started waving his tail and so on. And I thought that was a classic ad. I, I always think of being a banker. <laughs> I don't think about that ad. It was just a classic at the time. But it is true that you know, Bendigo Bank, and I saw this working through the advisory board when we first set this up, does really have those values, and I think that's really, really good. And it's a very good match for Deacon. That being said, we get it. So I'm not doing the presentation, by the way. I'm just, just guys. <laughs> We're getting ready for, the, ready for the end of the financial year, which is uh, all about looking at what happened in the past and our future financial year and how we're going to generate perhaps a little more wealth for ourselves and I'll give it all to the ATO. We have a couple of eminently qualified speakers here today and Josh Sharp and Roger Frederick to offer their insights and share their knowledge with you. I'm sure you'll also have questions, we'll have a Q&A session 
Uh, a free deposit of $100 for the first person to ask the question. <laughs> um, it's always a hard bit to get the first question. So if you don't save $100, actually, you better ask the first question, mate. Okay. And well, now I'd like to move on and introduce Josh. Josh is a business development associate at Leveraged, uh, a subsidiary of Bendigo Bank. With over 13 years financial service experiences, experience, Josh has a proven record of helping customers generate wealth through online share trading and gearing. So I'll pass you to Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much for the introduction here, Barry. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming along here today. Hopefully I'll provide a little bit of insight um, on share trading and margin lending. And we'll get the presentation up and running. I'm glad um, it's you and not me because I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, fantastic. We've got a clicker here. A right, um, little bit of insight in terms of, in terms of leverage um, and Bendigo Invest Direct. Leverage is mar uh, the Bendigo Bank's margin lender um, and we've recently brought on into the product suite Bendigo Invest Direct which is a bank's online share trading platform. Leverage is, I believe, and I stand to be proven incorrect, but I believe the longest standing margin lender in, in Australia, if, if not um, thereabouts. Um, and, and we're very pleased to be able to be associated with the Bendigo Bank um, and especially the Deakin Uni Community Bank as well. And before I go on, the most probably the most important uh, slideshow here, um, the disclaimer, I won't go through it all word, word for word, I'm, I'm sure you've all read it already, um, but basically everything I go through today is general advice only, not taking into account anyone's personal needs, so please remember that. Okay, so big life goals. Um, we've all got big life goals and they probably all differ from person to person. I know we've got a wide range of ages here in the room, um, but it could be anything from buying that first home, um, and we'll touch on that in the, in the slide coming up and how expensive that is becoming, and I'm sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, travelling overseas, more and more people are now travelling overseas, um, and, and that costs money. So whether whether that's a goal you need to, need to put a savings plan in action for or think how, think outside the square in terms of how you're going to save for that next holiday. Um, sending your kids to a great school. Now, again, we might, we might not all be thinking about children. I know there's some younger people in the room here. Uh, I know, Roger, you, you've got one on the way, mate, so this might be relevant to you. Um, interesting stat that I read recently. For a child born in 2018, it's estimated that if you want to send that child through a private school education, going to cost around about $500,000 for one child. Um, I'm presuming that's from prep to year 12, but it's pretty daunting, it's a pretty daunting figure. Um, and yeah, it's not something I've got a couple of young kids and I didn't like reading that. <laughs> so, um, this, could be, this strategy that I'm about to talk about could be quite relevant if you're looking at saving um, to send your kids through a um, private school education. And also retiring comfortably, um, saving outside of super, um, that retirement age is increasing um, and also obviously when we retire we want to ensure that we've got enough money to do so and do so comfortably so we've got to again think outside the square in terms of how we're going to be able to help ourselves do that. Bringing, bringing me back to that um, piece, on, piece on property so we've got the metropolitan um, median house prices here which you can see and it's a pretty daunting chart the median house price there is 740000 for Melbourne, um, and for an apartment it's a touch over 500000 as well. So I'm presuming, and Ash, I know Ash will certainly know about this, but there is that minimum $20,000 deposit required when you're entering the property market. So off the top of my head there, 700000 you're going to need 140000 to get into the property market if you're wanting to buy a house, or around about 100000 for a for a unit or an apartment. Um, which which again will take a fair bit of time saving. And um, the options, I guess the options of, of doing that and how, how my, my presentation today might be relevant, we can see here that Australian shares, so since 1926, so we're looking over a very long time period here, Australian shares have actually outperformed residential property in Australia. Only, only just, but they certainly outperform residential property. So you've got a return per annum of 11.3% um, on residential, oh, sorry, on Australian shares and 11% in property. Now, it, it pretty decent, pretty decent returns, and you'd be quite happy to get returns like that. And I guess the benefit of 
um, being able to invest in shares is that the minimum investment amount is five hundred dollars. So, un unlike entering into a property market, you don't need a huge amount of money to get into it, and, and you can chip away as you as you go on. Um, and you have a look there, the, um, the cash and the return on cash at 5.5%. It's a lot higher than what it is now. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I think it's around about 2.5% on term deposits at the moment, um, which only just, if not, um, keeps up with inflation. So we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing now a lot of younger people looking at alternative investments outside of just popping their money into term deposits. Brings me on to the bank's um, share trading platform, which I touched on earlier, Bendigo Invest Direct. So it's a new share trading platform that the bank rolled out a couple of years ago. It is now the third fastest growing product in the bank, um, which, which is a great success for us. Um, and, and from a recent ASX study, Australian Stock Exchange um, study that was released last year, it was a very interesting um, point on there about younger investors. So, in the last five years, people between the ages of 18 to 24, the percentage of people in that age demographic investing into the Australian share market has actually doubled. Um, so it's gone from 10% to 20%, and we're, we're seeing more and more, especially on our share trading platform, the appetite for younger people to invest into the share market is just growing and growing. Um, I don't have the exact answers for that and why that is, but it's probably safe to presume that again, it's a lot easier to invest your money into shares than it is to go and go and buy a house. And a lot of people that we that we do speak to are using um, investing into the share market as a strategy to get that house deposit because we we look at the really expected returns and what they expect to get from their investments. Um, you compare that to just popping money into a return deposit, and I'm, I'm not trying to take away any term deposit business here, Ash, but. Um, the say to say the expectation of the, of the returns that they're going to get from their investments are going to, be going to be outweighing um, the return on cash. So to, to, to touch on Bendy Invest Direct a little bit further, it's very easy to use. Um, you can apply for it online. It takes anywhere between five to ten minutes to to go through the application stage online. Um, it can be used in can be used on your phone or on the PC, um, and same as the application on the phone or via the PC. It's very affordable, um, it's very competitive in, com in comparison to our competitors. Brokerage is $19.95, um, which we've recently been running a, a campaign to get some new customers on board, and, and that is quite a competitive rate. Um, and, and I'll touch on um, an offer for everyone in the room a little bit later, which is a special discount for shareholders, which applies to everyone that's here today. Um, so it's even cheaper than that, 1995 as well. One good thing about the uh, share trading platform is we've got on there seven self-paced learning modules. So if you actually have an interest and you don't know a lot about the share market and you want to find more about it, the intricacies involved, how to buy and sell shares and, and the benefits that are associated with doing so, we've got seven self-paced learning modules on there. Um, so again, it doesn't cost anything to sign up. It takes about five or ten minutes to do so. It will ID you, providing you you put your driver's license details and passport details in there correctly. It will ID you online. Then once you've signed up, you can go in there and have a play around in your own time and leisure. Um, but if you are interested in finding out more about the share market and, and, and how you can invest in it, there are other seven self-based learning modules on there, which um, we found, especially when we're promoting um, the share trading platform to staff internally. There's a lot of internal staff working in the branches that don't know a heap about share trading and, and the, the stock market, and they're signing up purely as an initial reason is to get in and have a play around with these modules. So I'd recommend that if you do want to find out a little bit more, signing up and having a look. So that's a, enough about the share trading for now. Um, also here to speak about margin lending and borrowing to invest. So as I may have mentioned earlier, leveraged, um, which is probably the primary part of our business is the margin lending space and, and most of our business historically has come from external to, to the bank so we get most of our business from financial planners and stockbrokers that refer their clients to use margin lending as a strategy. Um, and I think I've jumped. Here we go. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, and I'll keep it at a very high level, what a margin loan is, is you using a portfolio of shares or managed funds as your security 
which we provide a lending value on, similar to a property in a, in a home loan. Um, we provide the lending value on that portfolio of shares and managed funds. You borrow money against it to, their, to then invest into other shares and managed funds and diversify your portfolio. Um, one, a couple of examples as to how that can work. You might have $2,000. You, you might think, okay, I want to put that $2,000 into the share market. But by using a margin loan, what you can do is you can contribute your $2,000 Borrow two thousand dollars, so you're increasing that exposure into the investment, and you're therefore investing four thousand dollars. And that, and how it works is you've got to be confident or comfortable that the return that you're going to be getting from your investment is going to out outweigh the cost of the borrowed funds. So obviously, if you're investing into something but it's only returning two percent, and and the cost of the margin loan is five point nine five, it's probably not going to be overly beneficial to you. Um, however, if if you're getting returns in excess of the cost of the borrowed funds, it's just additional income by using some borrowed funds to invest. Um, there's no set date to repay the loan, it's an ongoing line of credit, it is interest only, it's completely up to you as to when you do repay the loan. Um, there are potential tax deductions as well in terms of the interest that, that you pay on the margin loan. So we're coming into probably our busiest time of the year in June where probably a third of our customer base fix and prepay their interest for tax deductions. Um, Roger would be a better place than I am to talk about those, but it is, is a very large part of our business and it's a strategy that our, a lot of our customers use. So I've probably already covered off most of this, but people do use margin lending as a way to accumulate wealth. So as opposed to just using their own money, they're quite comfortable and confident that the return they're going to get from their investment is going to outweigh the cost of the borrowed funds, so they're using borrowed funds to help speed up that process. And it comes back to those goals that I was talking about earlier by putting a strategy in place to help accelerate your, um, your savings towards that goal you have in mind. Um, people use it for savings outside of super as well. It might be a little bit more easy to access and, and uh, money inside your super. So people are using that with surplus cash that they have. Um, there's longevity risk, and for those of you that aren't quite sure what longevity risk means, basically it's a great problem to have. People are living longer, um, whether that's advances in um, medicine and the like, but people in Australia are living longer. Now, because they're living longer, they're going to need money for longer as well. So we're seeing that um, people are taking that into consideration when they're, when they're using margin lending and gearing as such as a, as a way to accelerate um, their, their savings. Diversification, I touched on that before. A lot of people may have a, a large holding in one company, um, and we say, say it's a Bendigo Bank or a BHP, and we, we lend 75% on that. They might have $100,000 of, of a company, um, and it's a large exposure to one company, and they're thinking, geez, I've got all my eggs in one basket here. So they're using that um, in conjunction with the margin loan to borrow, to get, borrow from that and, to, and invest into other companies as well, so they don't have all, uh, all their eggs in one basket. And I've touched on tax planning as well. It's a massive part of our business. Now, how we actually pro um, provide shared value, especially to the Deakin community. Um, by doing your banking with us, it, it does flow into the profits of, that are made um, and that go back into the Deakin community. So for Bendigo Invest Direct, so the share trading platform, from that brokerage that I spoke about earlier, $1.50 from every trade actually gets pumped back into the community bank, um, which doesn't sound a lot, but if you've got enough people trading and there's a lot of people out there that trade, and a lot of people that trade on a regular basis, it quickly quickly adds up. And um, it's, it's $1.50 that your competitors will be contributing back into, into the community. So, <coughs> If you know of anyone out there that's associated with with Deakin um, and they trade with with a competitor, um, keep that in mind because it's a, it's an additional way to raise raise funds for the community. And as well as that, we've got the margin loan where 50% 50 of the profits that we make from a margin loan, um, if it is affiliated and linked to the community here, 50% of that profit goes back to the community. I did mention uh, the specials for everyone in attendance here today. So brokerage is discounted, so this is the offer that we have for shareholders, but I'm more than happy to um, offer it to anyone here today. It's decreased to $17.95, which is quite competitive. More, 
more often than not, most um, most online share trading platforms will charge you about 19.95, which is what our stock standard one is. Um, some charge even more, but yeah, 1795 is very competitive brokerage. And again, that dollar fifty back in community bank um, is applicable. And a discounted interest rate of 5.95 percent for the margin loan as well. So if anyone's interested in discussing that further, and I'm mindful of time here. Um, by all means, come and see me later. Um, we can run through a couple of different hypotheticals if you do have any questions. We won't go through the questions now. We'll save that for the end. But thank you all very much for your time. Um, hope you benefit from that. And again, if you've got any questions, please ask me at the end. Thank Thanks you. Josh. Thank you, Josh, for that very uh, interesting and informed presentation. And now I'll pass across to our next speaker, Roger Frederick. He's a chartered accountant and a captain in the Army Reserve. His expertise includes accounting, taxation, and advisory services, and has first hand experience for many years of running his own business. He's also spent over 10 years in the Army Reserve in various leadership and instructional roles. Also, pleased to say that Roger, I've worked with Roger for a few years now through the Deakin Alumni. He's a um, past president of the Deakin Business School. In fact, he actually helped set that up at the time, uh, and serves on the Deakin University Community Bank Board. Uh, as I mentioned before, has um, uh, been associated with the Deakin Business School alumni, in fact, was, is a former president. So, Roger, pass it across to you. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I get started, just thought I'm going to gauge as to everyone's level of investment. Does anyone here own a property? Hands up. Okay, handful, maybe. Third of the room, does anyone own an investment property? Yep, okay, a few less. Okay, brilliant, excellent. Okay, so today's presentation is going to be around um, investment property and tax. So obviously your home is a personal use asset, so it's obviously not deductible for tax purposes. And um, tax can sound like a really boring topic to talk about, so um, I don't want to refer to it as tax, I want to refer to it as uh, how, to, how to keep more money that you earn in your pocket. So everyone likes to keep more money, so we'll refer to it as uh, cash savings or tax savings. So for this presentation, I've um, chosen a random example, um, a, re a recent example, um, and I've plugged in um, a series of calculations and, and scenarios based on different income brackets to sort of see how it's relevant to you. And also before I progress, who here is in full-time work? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, more than half the room, excellent. And I presume the rest of you are either studying or potentially part-time. So this um, will be relevant to you maybe once you start working full-time or if you've got um, family backing, potentially you could also invest uh, while you're in uni you part-time. Mine's a little bit more um, simpler. Quickly, because I'm not representing a bank, so it for me. So what I'm using here is obviously for informational purposes only, um, and they're just illustrations. And obviously, your personal circumstances may vary, so um, seek uh, professional advice. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a scenario there. So. Um, You've got a budget, 550k, that's what you want to invest in buying a investment property. Um, you've managed to get savings of 20%, so 110 grand, plus you've got enough money for stamp duty. Stamp duty is roughly um, 5, 5.5%. And obviously if you're a first home buyer, it's different, but we're talking about investment, so um, there aren't concession, as many concessions when it comes to investment. You're looking for a target rental yield between 4 and 5%, so what that is is take your annual rent, you divide it by the cost of the asset, that's your rental yield, and that's about on, on generally on par with what market is um, that you'd like to go for as an investor, but if you, obviously now the property prices have gone up a lot more, so if you're um, buying properties that cost a lot more maybe inside the city, your rental yields are likely to be a lot lower. You're looking for a property that's going to give you steady capital growth, You've got a medium to long term hold strategy, so in excess of five years, so sort of five to ten plus years hold strategy. And in terms of preferences, you'd like to buy a new property, something between new to seven years old, and you want something that's easy to rent out, that's a three to four bedroom, two to three bath, double lock up garage. So the sort of property that if you're a family, um, you 
target market being family, that's the sort of property that you want to rent. One or two kids, uh, got, you know, mum and dad's got a room, or you've got a room, you might have some guests, so you might have um, a couple of kids, and you've got a spare study room. So that's the sort of property that is um, generally a good investment grade property. So I just did a bit of Googling and I thought, okay, well, let's just choose a random suburb. Craig Newman's not that random. I lived there for two years, so I'm familiar with that side of town. So I just chose this particular property, which I just went into real estate and typed in uh, properties for sale in Craig Newman. So it's advertised between 480 to 528, uh, and that was literally downloaded uh, yesterday. So it looks nice, you know, you've got a double garage, brick, uh, you can park the car on the driveway. Um, and when I lived in Craig Manor, I lived in a property that looked almost exactly like that. So if you actually, on realestate.com, click on this link, usually in the listing, it's called Statement of Information. So I think the real estate industry was getting targeted for not disclosing enough information and misleading buyers um, into uh, like lowballing the advertised price on properties, so buyers turn up and they don't actually get an opportunity to buy it, so I think they've been scrutinised, so they have to provide a sort of statement of information. So it's usually a link, and you click through it, and it comes up. So as part of that, they usually have to disclose some um, comparable prices of recently sold properties. So down the bottom, you can see 32 Taylor Street, 41 Evergreen Crescent, um, and 60 Gravel Street, all sold for 520, 515, 515. So they're all comparable properties. So this is a four bedroom, uh, two bath, double garage. So for the purpose of this illustration, I've assumed that this property is going to cost me around 520, which is on the upper end of that bracket. So, okay, well that's what it's going to cost. Well, once I buy it, what can I rent it out for? So I, I did another rent search um, on realestate.com, came up with these properties. I think um, whoever the listing agent for professionals is, is got to be excited and put the price right up on this one. Uh, most of the properties in that sort of range, it's a four bedroom, two bathroom, two garage, is rented for about 430 as you can see over there. All right, so the numbers. So, so obviously I'm, I'm a tax accountant. We, on a daily basis, provide tax advice, uh, investment, not investment advice, but tax advice when it comes to investments, um, when it comes to tax structuring, both from a personal business, uh, family trust, all those entity structures, so this is something that we do every single day we're very comfortable with. So for the purpose of this illustration, uh, uh, the rental uh, price that we rented it out for was 430 a week, times 52, you've got your income for the year. Uh, advertising and marketing, so maybe you rent out the property after you've purchased it, you've got some costs that you've incurred, uh, potentially some cleaning costs to get it to a position to rent. Uh, council rates um, for a property similar to that, Roughly there, you know, give or take five hundred dollars. Interest on loan. So we've assumed for the purpose of this illustration that it's an eighty percent LVR, so you put down twenty percent. So you basically you've borrowed eighty percent of the purchase price at an interest rate of five percent. So obviously, you know, the, the Ash can talk to you about interest rates and, and they vary, but five percent is being conservative. I think there's some good deals out in the market at the moment. Um, Couple of other expenses, repairs and maintenance, smoke alarm, insurance obviously as a landlord you want to make sure the building is insured, some water charges, which is um, not the usage but the rates portion of it, uh, some sundry costs, uh, which I think is I put in there fifty dollars just for random sundry costs, as well as like a wealth package or an annual loan package. Management fees obviously usually the agents that lease it out takes a clip of the ticket, they usually charge between five and a half. Seven and a half percent. So for the purpose of this, six point six percent. And I think this is a, a terrible cost that they just charge. They charge you two dollars sometimes, or what's called a statement fee, to generate a, a rental statement for you. So those are all the cash outflows, and then down the bottom you've got your non-cash, um, which is your depreciation. So obviously you've purchased the asset using a loan, uh, so you don't actually pay for that um, on an ongoing basis. It's incorporated into the purchase of the property. So it's a non-cash deduction for tax purposes, and unfortunately, um, the treasurer has changed. The treasurer and the treasury have changed the rules around capital allowances. So from one July, second-hand properties um, you can't claim any tax deductions on. But previously, you used to be able to claim uh, something similar to this. You might be able to get up to five to seven thousand dollars of a deduction on a diminishing value. Obviously, that will go down over time. But for the purpose of this, no additional deduction for capital allowances. So total expenses, 
30,555. Total income, 22,360. So you've got an investment loss of 8,195. Let's unpack it just a little bit more. Cash in, cash out. The net cash flow is 4,445 because a portion of that loss was obviously depreciation because you don't actually pay for it. So in terms of out of pocket, you're out of pocket about $86 a week or $371 per month. Right, so, if you, so then there's a non cash deduction, which is if it works, 3750 So, from a cash loss perspective, if you've got a wear 4445, you've got non cash loss of 3750 So, in your tax return, you plug in 8195, or your account will plug that in for you. You've got a tax benefit. So, people think, oh, I'm going to getting this tax deduction, it's $1,000. It's not $1,000 in your pocket, it's $1,000 times whatever tax you pay on that additional thousand dollars worth of income. So if you know in Australia we've got sliding scale, there's zero to eighteen two, there's no tax, eighteen two to thirty seven, you've got uh, nineteen cents in the dollar, thirty seven to ninety, thirty two and a half, ninety to 180. So it's a sliding scale. So for this scenario, I've sort of assumed that you work full time. If you work full time on minimum wage, you earn about thirty six grand a year plus super. So I assume everyone works full time and you're maybe just a little bit above minimum wage. So illustrate at 37 to 90k. Uh, so you got a tax saving per annum of 2663. If you're in the next bracket, you get a tax saving of three grand. And if you're in the top bracket, you've got a tax saving of about three seven. So from a weekly perspective, 51 to 71 dollars a week you save in tax. So if you add in the tax benefit into how much you have to pay out of pocket. All you have to pay in order to hold your property is fifteen to thirty-five dollars a week in this scenario. So, you know, if you liken it to a meal out, it's uh, maybe it's some dumplings or it's some. Um, it's you know, Nando's is pretty expensive. So maybe <laughs> you and your girlfriend or your boyfriend have, have a serve at Nando's, thirty-five bucks a week. That's sort of what it costs to hold the property um, if you average out all the numbers. So. There is this thing that you can do, it's called a tax withholding work variation, so that allows you to, rather than wait till the end of the financial year to get your tax refund, you can actually lodge a form and then it'll instruct your employer to withhold less tax, so you get that tax saving up front every time you get paid. Alright, so I know I've gone really fast because I'm just conscious of time and I want to leave space for questions, but I suppose the summary of all of this is... In this scenario, which is not an uncommon scenario, the real, real, real property that I just showed, it doesn't cost a lot to hold property in order to get a tax benefit. Obviously, the, the other part is getting into buying the property where you're going to save the money, so that might be the more challenging part, but I'm sure Ash can strategize with you to find ways to get into your property, because you don't always have to put down 20%, you can put down less. Uh, I'll leave that to Ash. Okay, summary of the tax scenario. So we talked about the revenue side of things, so money in, money out. So this, now we're talking about the capital side of things in terms of like the growth and the value of the property. So capital, capital assets held over time may go up in value. Yeah, they're likely to go up in value, but I've just got may go up in value. Historically, they've gone up in value in Australia, and based on Josh's slide, that was 11% over 100 years, right? 11% per annum. Compounding? Yep, compound. So, in general, property double every seven to ten years. That's I think a lot of you might have heard about that. Um, I don't know who the author of that is, but based on those graphs, it looks like in general that is the case. So even in an unfavourable scenario of no to low capital growth, the worst case scenario is you're paying out of pocket to hold the property fifteen to thirty five dollars a week, or seven hundred and eighty to two grand a year. But if it goes up, however, like say fifty percent which is you know, performing below what generally happens. Uh, over 10 years, that's 260K in capital gain on a 520K purchase. So only pay tax on 50, so if you hold the asset for more than a year, there's more tax concessions, you only have to pay tax on 50% of the gain. So anyway, the summary of all of that is, if you held it for 10 years, it went up 50% in value, after tax, you've got about 200K that you'll have um, as cash. So. Based on Josh's um, uh, information around tax five hundred grand to put your kid through private school, you've got a couple of these. By the time the kid's ten, you might be well on your way to be able to put them through private schools. Is it worth it? Well, that's your call. Um, 
10 years of hiding cost at 18.20 per annum on the upper end is 18,200 over 10 years. So assume that no principal is paid down, so let's just say it's an interest only loan, and assume that there's no rent that's been increased. Uh, it's cost you, costed you over 10 years 18,200 to hold on to, and you could make in this scenario about 200 grand. So is it worth it? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, and also, you're likely to be paying down principal, and you're also likely to be having rental increases over the year. So your returns are probably likely to be better, and your out of pocket is likely to be lower. Should I invest? Well, that's your call. You need to prepare a robust budget, ensure you have savings, and are not investing to your limit. Because obviously, if there's not, like if there's a you know a unexpected expense, you know maybe you need to replace a a toilet in a bathroom or whatever it may be because you've got some grubby tenants, well then obviously you don't want to be invest investing to your limit because you need to have at least a little bit of extra buffer for those circumstances. Um, you should look at your core expenditure and available discretionary surplus. So it's a lot of words there. But basically, what does it cost for me to live? How much money do I have left over after I work? Um, and obviously a portion of that will go towards investing, maybe some towards saving, maybe some towards partying and having a fun. So consider what other sacrifices you may need to make to make now to have a possibility of a stronger future. And I, uh, this is a saying that I've come across in my quite life, is if you keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you've always got. So if you do nothing, that's also fine, but nothing's likely to change. If you do something, um, and even in an unlikely 50% return scenario over 10 years, uh, you're likely to be in a much better position 10 years from now. So if you want more information around property and loans, I'd suggest to speak to Ash, who's sitting at the back here, and I'm sure he'll be available at the end of this. Um, and if you want to know more information around uh, anything around tax, um, business, or anything like that, those are my contact details. I'll also be around, um, and I've got a couple of cards if you want to have a chat with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Excellent. Okay, so we have some time now for some questions. So to save Ash having to deposit $100 in the bank account, <laughs> a lot. I've got a question for Ash, actually. Um, Ash, can you um, elaborate perhaps a little on the deposit needed for first home versus investment uh, property? Yeah, so for the first term buyers, you generally need a 5% deposit, plus you need the funds to pay for the mortgage insurance. So when you include that mortgage insurance cost, it's a roughly 8% deposit for a first term buyer. And then for an investment, you need a 10% deposit. So slightly a bit more than first term buyer. But yeah. So you can borrow up to 90% on an investment property. And you, as you're borrowing a bit more, that's, that's tax, the main tax uh, deductions available there. So, yeah. Good question. Thank you. I've got a question for Josh. Um, with margin lending, then what, what sort of security is involved to have to get the margin loan? In terms of security, you can all the stuff up. Cash yep. is your initial contribution if you've got cash. Yep. Um, but if, if you do have stock, exist, existing stock that you own, um, you can lodge shares, managed funds, exchange traded funds, SMAs, um, separately managed accounts. It's yeah, there's a whole host oh, of okay. different sort of investments that you can yeah, you can lodge. And the, I don't know, it's a 53 page list of investments that we provide lending on, so it's quite okay, uh, quite extensive. Yeah, very extensive. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? Hello, uh, Josh. Hey, uh, um, with your bid platform, yep. if you don't know a whole, whole lot about some shares and things like that, yep. I'm told you can you can get into ETFs and things like that, which are a bit easier to, a bit more accessible for people less yeah, so valuable on some. Yeah, spot on. So exchange traded funds, um, they basically track. They're, they're similar to a managed fund, um, whereas I, as opposed to having to um, pay a fund manager or have a fund manager take out their clip. Um, you basically buy an exchange traded fund which tracks an index. Um, it's got, I guess, because it does that, it's not buying one single company, it's all, almost got that you build diversification without it, and you can buy that directly online. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions at all? I'd perhaps like to make a comment about investing in property. Uh, my first investment in property, I think, was in 1975 before half the people in this room were even born. And I borrowed 8000 from the, what was in the Bank of New South Wales, 3000 from the credit union, putting $100 myself, 
test us a little test 100. I did the conveyance in myself because I couldn't afford to pay a conveyance. That was the best investment I ever made. So, you know, in the long term. Uh, and the other issue, of course, is getting good tenants because sometimes tenants trash houses. There's always that risk you have when you invest in property. Um, but as the, you know, if you're not into investing shares, I've never invested in shares apart from having a few Telstra shares and a few AMP shares, the worst possible shares to have at the moment. Um, I'm still not really sure how I got them. <laughs> I look at the franking credits and sort of stuff I do on tax return. I'll have to get rid of them. Um, but I've found that uh, I found the property has been a pretty good investment. But you need to be astute. You know, property prices have really skyrocketed in, in recent times, um, but you know, they are starting to, to level out now, of course. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if you buy a good solid property, it's pretty hard to lose money. All right, so, uh, lots of oh yes, we have. Oh, now all of a sudden questions. Oh, I, I must, must have got your thinking of that. Okay. 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 So um, whenever I've thought about doing any of this sort of investing, I go and see somebody and they talk in a language that I just don't understand and they ask me for too many decisions. So, um, and so I end up withdrawing and not doing anything about it. So I just, really, I, I want somebody who's got a lot more knowledge than me, that did their degree and they've, they've invested their life because yeah. that's how they're earning their living. I don't earn my living this way, I earn my living working at a uni. So I want it made as um, uh, easy for me as possible. So you can talk to me about all these things as much as you like, but I'll then feel tentative about investing because I won't really understand what you're saying. So what I'm asking here is, what's my sim the simplest way that I can start this? this I would say, after this seminar, talk to Roger. He's <laughs> 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 one of the nice guys, because we told him, okay? He's a deep graduate, you look after the deep person. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, but that's, that's a fair comment, yeah. you know, because it is the unknown for a lot of people. Uh, and it's, it can go wrong, as I said before, you can get more than a grubby tenant. I mean, things do, do go wrong, but... Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I think property's a pretty good investment. Yes, Ash, you want to say something? Yeah, just that respond to your comment as well. I guess there's also a bit of mistrust in the public against bankers and you know, the industry itself. So and real estate agents. Yeah. Real estate agents. Yeah. Um, so with us, we don't get paid commission. We, we, yeah. The advice we give you is actually in your best interest, and all of us, we've been through it. Yeah. Um, we've bought properties. Yeah. We've got the life experience between us in terms of the real estate. So the best thing to do is just have it chat over a cloth, there's no obligation at all. Just and even and it's not about product flogging or anything. It's just actually trying to help you, you know. The way I see it is we we work for a purpose and if we can retire earlier and have that lifestyle you want earlier, property gives you that, that option. So I've I've done it since I was twenty one and never regretted it. So even if I wasn't in banking, I'd be saying to my friends, buy property and retire earlier, have that lifestyle you want. Yeah, I, I hear you. I get what you're saying. Yeah. We'll talk to you in, in, a, in a language that everyone understands. That's what I was saying. God keeps making more people, we stop making more people. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you live, I lived in Hong Kong and I was creating language. They keep pulling mountains down. Yeah. <laughs> That's why taxes are very slow, low in Hong Kong because they just make a few selling mm -hmm. You have a question? Yes, uh, this is probably for Josh. Yes. Um, Josh? Yeah. With regard to ethical investments, is there any trends, any, anything that, that actually um, in terms of, so in terms of the output, um, I can't, I, I think there's ones out there that are paying in recent years 8%, something like that, but I can't provide any, any advice on any of those, um, you, you have to do your own research, but there, there is a growing demand for ethical investing, um, so whether that's something like a managed fund where you've got your professional fund manager looking after the portfolio of shares on your behalf and you're just buying units in that. Um, we have seen the take-up of companies providing a socially responsible fund or something along those lines where it provides that, I guess, ethical part of investment um, because a lot of people now are thinking along those lines that they want to be investing in an ethical company. So, yeah, there has been certainly, I guess, a shift in people taking that up, um, but in terms of which ones to choose, I can't provide any advice then. We have a range of options on the website that we'll be showing. What's that, sorry? We have a range of options on our website. Yeah, on our, so on our website, um, sort of reverse, reverse what Barry was asking before, we've got a really extensive list um, of, 
well, I guess that's from a margin lending point of view as to funds that we will lend on, um, which may and well, which does include some ethical investments, um, whether they're direct direct companies. So you might find a couple of companies if you know um, are ethical and you want to invest in them directly, or you could choose a managed fund. Um, I know, and again, I'm mindful I can't give any advice, but I know that Sandhurst, um, who uh, also a subsidiary of Benigo and Adelaide Bank, they offer a socially responsible managed fund. Um, I'm sure they're not the only one out there, um, but I know that they do offer that, and I think more and more companies are mindful of that and they're, they're offering them. So, yeah, we provide lending on a whole host of those, but if you're not looking for a margin loan um, and you're just wanting to invest in them, there's definitely ones out there you just need to do due diligence. And I guess speaking to a financial planner might, might um, be worthwhile as well, although they've copped a bad rap recently too. So <laughs> <financial planner. laughs> Or if you're in super, like Uni Super, for example, you can designate that you want to invest in Todd in, 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 you know, start up a company, so that way you can do it. Okay, I'm going to have to call it a quit to that. I would like you to give a big hand to the guest speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs> as, as, as we stand from the speakers, we're around for a few minutes. Please take some food. Deacon always over caters. I've been, <laughs> never been to an event yet. The deacon doesn't over cater. So if you want to save on lunch, just help yourself and take some goodies. And we don't have goodie bags. To get <laughs> Please help yourself and don't rush out and enjoy what you need to eat and catch up. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.